YouTube canlı yayını başladı şu anda. Hocam hazırsanız başlayalım. Evet başlayabiliriz. Hello everyone, welcome to Medical Geology Conference. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Hüseyin Akkuş. Uh, just a little bit talk about myself. Uh, I am a geological engineer, expert in slope stability, avalanche and flood in the uh, Republic of Turkey Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry uh, in Ankara. And uh, also uh, I am a 28 uh, time board of member in Chamber of Uh, geological engineers. Uh, to, to, today we are organizing uh, this conference under the leadership of Medical Geology Working Group of our chamber and uh, in uh, partnership with the General Directorate of Mineral Research and Exploration. So we are uh, very excited to have Professor, Prof, Professor Dr. Uh, Gazo Jordan from Hungary as uh, our guest uh, to talk about the uh, geochemical composition of our environment and its direct and foodborne effects on human health. So now uh, I would like to give permission our Chamber of Geological Engineers, President Hussein Alan, for opening speech. Uh, dear uh, Alan, please uh, open your microphone. Evet, değerli hocalarım, değerli katılımcılar, e, öncelikle hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Hepiniz şahsım ve Oda Yönetim Kurulu adına saygıyla, dostlukla selamlıyorum. E, bugün Hüseyin arkadaşımızın da açılış prezentasyonunda ifade ettiği üzere uzun zamandır tıbbi jeoloji çalışma grubumuzun e, yürüttüğü çeşitli çalışmalar söz konusuydu. E, çeşitli çalıştaylar gerçekleştirdik, simpozyumlar yine Türkiye Jeoloji Kurultaylarında e, özel oturumlar e, gerçekleştiriyoruz. E, bu yılın yani 2020 e, yılı içerisinde özellikle MTA Genel Müdürlüğü'nün jeokimya e, haritalarını daha doğrusu atlasına ilişkin çalışmalar tamamlanmasından sonra bu atlastan yararlanarak ülkemizin tıbbi jeoloji risk haritalarını hazırlayabilir miyiz? düşüncesiyle bir girişimde bulunduk. Sağ olsunlar MTA Genel Müdürü ve ekip de bunu kabul etti. Bizim tıbbi jeoloji çalışma grubunda yer alan hocalarımız ve MTA Genel Müdürlüğü ile ortak toplantılar gerçekleştirdik. Umut ediyorum ilk kez Eskişehir özelinde pilot bölgede orayı belirledik bir tıbbi jeoloji risk haritasının altyapısının oluşturulması konusunda da ilk çalışmalarımıza bu yıl başlamış olacağız. Tabii bu çalışmalara başlarken e, uluslararası deneyimleri de öğrenmek istedik. E, bu konuda MTA Genel Müdürlüğü'nden e, Doktor Nuray Karapınar'ın önerisiyle e, Doktor Jorgud'un e, Macaristan'daki deneyimlerini bizlere aktarmasını istedik. Bu toplantı da o şekilde ortaya çıktı. Ben bu toplantı davetimizi kabul ettiği için Doktor Jordan'a çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ayrıca tabii bu girişimlerde bize destek veren Doktor Şuray Karapınar arkadaşımıza da çok çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ve bu etkinliği Oda ve Meta ortaklaşı olarak gerçekleştiriyoruz. Umut ediyorum Macaristan'ın deneyimlerinden bizler de elde ettiğimiz bilgilerle daha iyi bir tıbbi jeoloji risk haritasını bu vesileyle hazırlama çalışmalarına da başlamış oluruz diye düşünüyorum. Ben sizler katıldığınız için tekrar hepiniz hoş geldiniz diyor. Teşekkür ediyorum. Dear Alan, thank you for opening speech. Uh, so before starting conference, Uh, I would like to introduce our conference moderator, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Dr. Alper Baba. Uh, since 2013, he has been teaching as a professor, professor doctor in Izmir Institute of Technology, mm -hmm. Faculty of Engineering, Department of Civil Engineering. Uh, his research interests are medical uh, geology, mm -hmm. environmental geology, groundwater uh, contamination, uh, hydrogeology, geothermal energy, engineering geology. And uh, he, he is also the chairman of the uh, medical geology working group of our chamber. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Baba, uh, we are, uh, Dr. Dr. Baba, we are uh, listening to you to introduce our guest. Thank you very much. 
Dear President, distinguished participants of the webinar, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to express my gratitude to the organizer of this important webinar on medical geology and welcome you all. As you know that the environmental health issue are a global in their reach, affecting the people in every country in the world to varying degrees. This discipline that study subset of the, these issues that are caused by geological material and geological processes. And then we call that now medical geology. It is relatively new disciplines having been formally organized only about a dozen of years ago. In the interviewing years, countries, several countries have reorganized the importance of this subject and have marshaled effort to address their medical geology issues. Today, interest in medical geology is growing and present of the geoscience, huge opportunity for collaboration work with the medical communities and other disciplines. This cooperation has a great potential to help understand, mitigate, and the possible irradiate environmental health problem that have plagued humans for thousands of years. As you know that, Turkey is an complex geological site with an active tectonic, they have high geothermal potential. These natural settings serve as suitable for the occurrence of the high level of toxic element in soil and water resources. Because of this and other situation, Turkey is creating a rich and highly original ground for medical geology studies. Especially Chamber of the Geological Engineer of Turkey and then the director of the mineral research and exploration has been working on the different aspects of the medical geology in Turkey. They did many Congress, they did many seminars, they many web, 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 webinars. Just one month ago, we did also some of the webinar about medical with the, some doctors groups. Mm -hmm. And then at that time, people is, you know, aware about this one. People now understand the importance of the medical geology and then an X-ray in Turkey. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we invited the in international scientists. We want to know, know that what's going to around to the world. Also, we are happy now the one of the books about the medical geology will be published in near features. But mm -hmm. these books mention about the medical geology effort in Turkey. And then also today, our keynote speaker, Professor Gyoza Jordan, and who is a geologist and environment geochemistry. And then recently, mm -hmm. is Act and Chemical Department Institute of the Environment Science in the San Svan University in Hungary. And then also the pro Professor Jordan work in many projects in many countries like in Netherlands, China, and Turkey. Uh, I, I know that now he, he met, before we start, he mentioned about uh, he worked in one year in Turkey from 2013 and 13, uh, ter, uh, 2014. And then he, at that time, he is a team leader of the European Aid Technical Assistance for Project Contamination of the Risk Assessment in Turkey. And then currently, he coordinates a research and technology development project on contamination geochemistry in China. And also, Professor Jordan led a bilateral project for with Hungary and Slovenia on heavy metal contamination in floodings in some delta and then related to human and ecosystem. And then Professor Jordan has many papers about soil contamination, geochemistry, mining, and environment, and it's related to human health. Uh, today, Professor Jordan gave a talk about the geochemistry process and is related with human health. And then he's, uh, he's going to focus on effect of natural and anthropogenic resource on human health. Welcome, Professor Jordan. Thank you very much again. You are coming to this important webinar. The floor is yours, please. Thank you, uh, Professor, Mr. Chairperson. Do you hear me? You hear me? Yes. Please. Very good. So yeah, again, uh, thank you for this nice introduction. And um, I also like to express my, that I feel privileged uh, to be uh, a presenter and give you a talk on the medical geology of international, based on international projects uh, on this important event organized by the reputed 
Chamber of uh, Engineering Geologists of Turkey and MTA, the Geological Survey of uh, Turkey. And my special uh, thanks are extended to Dr. Nuray Karapinar uh, for the nice uh, arrangements and uh, personal invitation. So uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and President and all distinguished guests and audience, uh, I would like to start my uh, presentation. I understand I have some 30, 40 minutes, but anytime you please call me and uh, I can speed up. I, of course, I respect the time limitations. So I turn to the uh, sharing of my screen to start up my uh, uh, PPT presentation. Uh, uh, oops. And this is my first slide. I hope uh, you can all see. Anytime, please feel free to interrupt me and give me some technical uh, guidance on this webinar internet, uh, online uh, technical issues. So uh, starting with the, uh, the, the, what is the role of geochemistry and medical geology? And as, as the um, uh, professor and chairman uh, presented, it's an increasing international uh, uh, problems and recognition. And based on the guidance I received from um, Dr. Karapiner, I would like to share my international projects, the ongoing project and experience, uh, what's going on in this field uh, with my background. Of course, at the end, it's always risk assessment of contamination risk assessment. And this is the first slide. So uh, from the source, where you have contamination, uh, of pollution such as arsenic and the pathways such as water, surface and groundwater. And then the receptors can be ecosystems and, and humans through food or direct intake. And this is called risk assessment. And that's at the end of the day, the society, the decision makers are interested in only in this aspect, how risky, how dangerous the contamination in a certain area it is for human health. So let me uh, give you a, a few introductory um, uh, slides about uh, geo geochemistry and environmental geochemistry. I understand that the audience is very, uh, is quite uh, multidisciplinary. So some uh, medical experts and some geochemists are also included. So then the starting point of environmental geochemistry and medical uh, geochemistry is uh, the global biological cycles of chemical elements. Let me give you a few slides about this as an introduction. So in order to understand the context on the global scale, of course, the water cycle, the global water cycle is the number one uh, geochemical cycle. Of course, this is just a BSc or even a secondary school material, but to understand this, uh, the water cycle, which is the main driving force of the cycle, the biogeochemical cycles, chemical elements is fundamental. And of course, uh, the source of, uh, of the chemical elements primarily comes from a rock. And this is uh, in the, the medical geology, this is the geology part. We have to understand that the primary uh, distribution of chemical elements on our surface is defined by the geology, by the rock. And in Turkey, as the professor chairperson mentioned that you have beautiful geology there, you have subduction zone there and the active tectonics. And this slide I just want to show this how continental spreading through the subduction and as you say the vul uh, volcanic activity and then erosion uh, distributes the chemical elements coming uh, primarily from the Earth's crust. Now uh, a second, um, a second uh, uh, most important geochemical cycle, global geochemical cycle, is the carbon cycle. It's also a secondary school or a BSc level uh, 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 course material. However, this is fundamental, how the carbon is cycling. So uh, taken uh, from the, for example, as a human input here on the right, you can see I show with the arrow, uh, the fossil fuel combustion, and then carbon dioxide reaches the atmosphere. And then this is, is the, uh, deposited through the ecosystems into the sea and then in the sediments, it is accumulated, such as in the uh, carbonatic rocks, like such as limestone or fossil fuels. And this is the, also the number two global bi biogeochemical cycle we have to understand to, uh, for the context of uh, medical uh, geology. And of course, in the middle of these, um, these cycles is we, the humans, the human body, the human health is, so we are a part, our body, 
is a part of the biogeochemical cycling cycles on, on Earth's surface. However, uh, let's take a closer look at uh, this uh, interaction of, uh, of man and the environment in terms of biogeochemistry. And here we have the, the basic concept of the critical zone. Uh, this is an American ID, and nevertheless, it's very useful. So if you take the landscape uh, seen in this cartoon, however, the, the, the zone of interaction in terms of exchange of material, chemical elements between human body and the environment is a very narrow zone. And this is called the critical zone expanding from the rock and water, groundwater and surface water, of course, soil, organism, and to the air, at least up to the top of the canopy of, um, of plants and trees. So this is a very narrow, very uh, thin zone. That's why it's critical zone. This is a, a zone of interaction and the primary focus of medical geochemistry or geology. However, when we scientists, you take a closer look at uh, of the, uh, of the uh, critical zone operation. Here I bring you the example of arsenic. Uh, you can see here that uh, arsenic is, for example, is, is uh, released from, uh, from the environment in various speciation in chemical forms. So for example, uh, methylated arsenic here, arsenic three and arsenic four is formed and this gets back to the ecosystem. And so groundwater reaches again uh, back to the, uh, back to the uh, ecosystem environment, to the sediments. So the speciation of, uh, of arsenic or chemical elements is also very important, often neglected. So actually uh, this cartoon indicates that we humans are actually uh, interacting at this level with our environment in terms of environmental chemistry. And this uh, field of uh, geochemistry is called landscape geochemistry. Here I bring you an example for a paper I'm very glad to share upon your request uh, to Professor uh, uh, Karapiner, uh, my publications or my, and my team's publications on these issues. So landscape geochemistry. Now we move to the, uh, uh, now after the general introduction uh, to the geochemistry and health issues, as the chairperson uh, introduced very well that uh, in Turkey, for example, you have a lot of thermal water and of course, very often people believe or, or have the misconcept uh, that uh, the chemical elements in high air concentration can be only poisonous, but this is not true. And here's an example, I guess, from, uh, from Hungary, I was asked to share you, with you uh, real case studies. And here is thermal spas, just like in Turkey, Hungary is also very rich in uh, thermal spas, and it has a healing effect due to radon. Uh, which is a radioactive uh, noble gas and carbon dioxide. So it's used for curing, has curing. It's a positive effect, as you can see in this picture. And here is just an internet that this hot spa has a healing effect due to the radon, radioactive gas uh, concentration, which a higher concentration can be. So uh, this shows that the uh, medical geology does have medical uh, positive effects. However, uh, let's uh, take a closer look at, uh, and I bring you a few examples of the medical geochemistry or geology issues. And this is the cadmium, as we all know, the Ita Ita disease, for example, uh, which is cadmium poisoning, uh, uh, comes from the word Ita Ita, which means severe pain, as you can read the slide, comes from Japan, and it, it uh, causes a bone and kidney failure, as this picture shows. Also, uh, and this cadmium uh, uh, case and the high cadmium concentration often comes from mining, uh, just like in uh, Japan, it occurred almost a century ago. Now, the Minamata disease uh, comes from, uh, uh, is caused by mercury poisoning. And the Minamata is also a well-known area of industrial activity in Japan associated with, with mining. Here's a further uh, example of selenium. Not only the high concentration can cause a medical or health problem, but the deficiency, the lack of essential chemical elements such as selenium deficiency causes the well-known Kashan disease. The Kashan disease, uh, again, uh, can be often fatal, or as you can see the picture, uh, can cause some uh, bone and other uh, distortions comes from China. 
In China, we have almost a transcontinental uh, zone as this uh, arrow or line, dash line, uh, shows a zone, a southeast, no, a southwest, northeast uh, a zone where we have Keshan disease, most probably linked to geology. Uh, and this is a deficiency problem of selenium. Another well-known issue is iodine. I think that perhaps this is the first uh, medical geochemistry or geology issue recognized uh, by science because the iodine deficiency as the medical experts of the particip participants of this uh, uh, meeting know very well that uh, here the goiter in your neck can cause a problem when there's a deficiency of iodine. In Europe, in Hungary, definitely iodine is added to the, to the uh, salt that you can buy in the shops in order to avoid this iodine deficiency problem. However, in the map, you can see that uh, almost uh, one, 187 million people uh, is uh, globally is uh, affected by the iodine deficiency as this map shows, for example, in uh, Inner Mongolia, Northern China, a great part of Africa and some parts of America has problems caused by iodine deficiency. So this is also, the iodine comes from the rock, from geology, and this is uh, an, another link. And of course, the lead uh, is also very poisonous uh, material, as we know, and causes permanent uh, 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 has problems in the brain, uh, first of all. And then uh, this was recognized as early as in the Roman, um, Roman times, in the um, ancient times, uh, as uh, shown by this picture. Although uh, we all know geologists that, uh, gal uh, that uh, lead, the galena, the lead sulfur, uh, sulfide is the, the, as is shown here in this photo, is the number one uh, mineral of for lead uh, source. And beautiful uh, paintings are produced. However, in the Roman Empire, when they used uh, lead pipes already for water pipes, they realized that lead can cause permanent brain distortion due to toxic effect. Lead comes from the rock. And then let me bring you an ex uh, a solid example for arsenic. And arsenic is uh, also uh, a toxic uh, material causing the well-known black food disease. So in Hungary, we have the problem. And as I was requested, let me show you a real case study of European Union project, how we dealt with uh, the arsenic contamination. So in the European Union uh, regulation, Turkey is an, uh, uh, an accession country for, uh, for uh, Europe. So the European Union regulations are uh, adopted, such as this one shown here on food. So uh, there are maximum levels of inorganic arsenic uh, set by this piece of law in Europe. And I, let me call your attention that rice is a special uh, plant which tends to accumulate arsenic in its tissue. So rice is particularly dangerous in terms of arsenic uh, poisoning through food. However, and this is the main message uh, for uh, here, is that the toxicity depends on the speciation, the chemical form of uh, arsenic and many chemical elements. And this is all, all, often forgotten uh, by uh, chemists, geochemists, or even medical geology uh, or medical experts. And here's an example. So arsenide and arsenate, the, the, the arsenic three, as you can see here is much more, oops, is much more toxic than uh, arsenate, uh, arsen five. So this should be recognized. Here, I, in, here I, below, I show you a slide uh, that uh, shows actually the speciation, the chemical bound uh, type of, oops, 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 uh, uh, chemical, oh, you are. Sorry. Anyway, the chemical bound of arsenic, as you can see that uh, it's either in inorganic in or, uh, or in other uh, organic forms. However, arsen-3 is much more toxic than anything else of any, any other forms of arsenic. And this is a global issue as the, as, uh, the professor chairman mentioned. You can see here, just try to use my, here we go. Uh, uh, the red areas, as I show you, shows that arsenic problem you have in China again, in the north, and in other parts of the United States, uh, the American continent. But here is Hungary, as you can see, and also in Bangladesh, in uh, in, uh, in India, 
but also in Hungary, we have uh, a lot of arsenic uh, has problems in Hungary. Let's take a look at how to analyze and deal with those arsenic issues. And this is the European Geochemical Atlas. I took part in this project of the European Geochemical Mapping Project. It's two, it was a 10 years project. And what you can see here is the arsenic contamination in stream of water or sorry, arsenic distribution in stream water and the red color indicates high concentration. You can see here as the, uh, that Hungary is, is pretty red. So it shows that we have high arsenic uh, concentration in the streams. However, if you take a closer look at, and this is the map of Hungary, not the scale. So this is a, a 10, uh, 100 kilometers. So the, this is a small country. Hungary is a small country. It's only 500 kilometers long, you know. However, uh, as you can see here in the groundwater, uh, the arsenic contamination, the red uh, area is just uh, basically focused in the southeastern part of Hungary, where this problem has been recognized in the 50s and the 60s. So this is really poisonous uh, groundwater due to the geological uh, conditions. It's a natural arsenic coming uh, into the groundwater. So this is a, a big problem, just like in Bangladesh, in, in India. So let's take a look at, uh, uh, call your attention again, that in Hungary, we had an EU project uh, quite some years ago, as uh, you can see in this slide, about how to analyze arsenic, the speciation is important. So you need special uh, laboratory instrumentation. I'm not going to give details. However, I understand that uh, in the audience you have uh, uh, engineers and I guess laboratory experts. So you need a, a HPSC and combined ICPMS uh, method and special field, field sampling in order to preserve uh, uh, in the field the arsenic-3 and arsenic-5 uh, oxidation state arsenic in the original water. So field sampling is important uh, and there are specific laboratory analysis. And here's the solution of what we had uh, with Dutch and German colleagues under this European Union project. You can see the field photo uh, and using primarily a series of chambers with iron oxide and other uh, filters, uh, if you push through the content arsenic contaminated water in this series of filters, then in the end, you can withdraw arsenic and have clean water. This is a very expensive uh, methodology. However, it is the technology is there is possible. So this is arsenic. However, summing up these, uh, these uh, overall uh, introduction, introductory part of my talk. Uh, so, so then we can see that both mercury and uh, selenium and, uh, and the sil silicosis we have here and the black food disease for due to arsenic attacks and interacts with various parts of human health and human body. However, we are not left alone as we uh, uh, learned from the nice introduction. Uh, medical geology as a science has emerged. I don't want to go in, in, the play, uh, in deep. And I'm very glad and of course, I'm aware that the Turkey are very active in this field. So we have uh, the medical geology and various books have been published. In Turkey, a new book is coming out, increasingly uh, re re receiving increasing recognition, the importance of medical geology based on what I've said so far. And of course, we are not left alone. There is an International Medical Geology Association. This is their website. Uh, I encourage all the participants and audience to, to click here. And uh, the MedGeo uh, International Conference is organized yearly. Uh, before the, the quarantine uh, period, uh, just two years ago in 2019, the MedGeo conference was organized in, in, in China. So uh, against this background, let me show you real case, international case studies, how we geochemists deal with medical geology. So the first thing I mentioned to you is field sampling. So sampling is very important to take the right samples, such as in arsenic and sample preservation, how they to rep have a representative sample you take out from the environment and bring to the laboratory. And there are international standards such as the US EPA listed here in this slide and the European Union uh, uh, methods, how to take sample on ISO standards, by the way, the legislative environment and to, bring, and to take a field test as the picture show here and in the laboratory. 
And also uh, further examples, you know, how to take uh, surface water uh, uh, samples in order to have representative samples uh, for various uh, species of chemical elements such as arsenic, chromium, as we all know, and mercury. Uh, further field tests I'm sharing with you, I just want to emphasize that the laboratory analysis and especially field sampling, specific field sampling is very important. I call the attention of the, especially the medical uh, expert audience to the importance of this part. And uh, here's an example of, uh, of environmental geochemistry and risk assessment that uh, as the introduction, it, it has been said, I was working and I was the leader uh, of the uh, European Union Technical Assistance Project for one year in Turkey, for the risk-based inventor of mining sites. The risk means that how risky of the three hundred mining sites we visited and tested in Turkey in this project some seven years ago, six, seven years ago, as the dots show here, and they use various technologies, sampling and laboratory uh, methods to analyze the associated risk in mining areas, which are the primary source of potential toxic element contamination. And uh, this was uh, a joint project with uh, uh, Dr. Karapiner uh, with the excellent uh, Turkey Geological Survey, among others. And then there was a follow-up. We are, as a point number two in this slide, you can see there's a follow-up TIEX workshop, European Union TIEX technical assistance workshop dedicated to the mining waste directed implementation and particularly a risk assessment. So who is at risk besides ecosystems, human health? So how to do risk assessment to protect humans, especially the highly toxic areas of, of uh, the high toxic uh, uh, regions of mining areas. And of course we gave uh, uh, various uh, international training courses in the laboratories and in the field to Turkish experts. Now, my field, however, specifically is geochemical maps. The, the geochemical maps are the number one tools of uh, finding areas and the distribution of chemical elements in the critical zone. One of the most prominent examples for this is the Global Geochemical Mapping Program. This is the United Nations and the IUGS, International Geological Sciences Program. And the whole Earth, the whole, sur Earth, uh, the, the whole surface of the Earth has been divided into cells, 160 kilometer cells, including Turkey, by the way. And according to the special uh, methodology, samples should be collected from stream water, from soil, from flat plain sediment, and uh, stream sediment samples. And I took part in this project. Here's the European example. You can see Turkey as well here, that how uh, our, our pro specific project in Europe uh, uh, verd in this case. And here is a, a result. It's another project of the GAMAS project, European Union project, but using the same principles. And this is a typical geographical map. In this project, 32 countries uh, took part. They collected uh, eight, more than 8,000 uh, soil and sediment samples. And here is an example for agriculture areas and the grazing lands. Uh, this is uranium uh, samples. So what you can see here is that the distribution of chemical elements is not random. There is pattern. So you can see here that for them, the high uranium content shown by red color is, uh, it has specific locations such as in Finland and in Sweden, for example, and in, in Portugal and Spain, you can see the volcanic area of uh, Italy down uh, in the south. And of course, there are low uh, concentration areas where in the soil, you don't have high uranium or toxic elements. So what you can see or what you can expect that um, uranium or other toxic element concentration, uh, uh, toxic element concentration is first of all not random and you, and you expect high risk for the medical, for the human health in these such areas with high concentration. And this is called geochemical mapping. And this is a European uh, example. And of course, this uh, database is freely available. I encourage all the audience to download it and uh, experiment with this uh, database. And of course, for such as this, this paper, the Science in Total Environment, leading papers, more than 40 scientific papers have been published on uh, this database. Here's an example uh, further on for copper and selenium in Europe. As you can see, again, in agriculture areas and grazing lands. Why agriculture and grazing lands? Because these are the number of uh, areas of, of land cover where you take food 
So then how the poison, how the toxic, toxic uh, uh, material can reach uh, the human body through food intake. So this was the objective of the project. And then uh, besides this, uh, uh, producing these nice colorful, uh, uh, these maps of the, the distribution and the concentration of toxic elements such as copper and selenium in this example, we also produced risk maps under the European REACH regulation. Uh, I encourage the interested to check these, uh, these regulation. And nevertheless, risk maps are also available in this case for copper. So which are the areas using the specific mathematical formula uh, uh, which are where you have potential risk of copper for human health and ecosystems. Again, uh, let me show you a European uh, example for nickel distribution. What you can see here is that uh, basically uh, using mathematical methods and the, the nickel geochemical map, you can see that there is uh, a southwest uh, northeast trending uh, red zones of nickel concentration. So the nickel concentration is not random. This is associated with continental scale geological features. And this has been published recently. And I'm very glad to share this paper with you. So again, geology guides the, the, the continental scale distribution of toxic elements such as nickel. Here's the United States examples based on the previous studies uh, of Europe. Uh, myself and my research team was asked by the American USGS and the Geological Survey to use the same mathematical methods to analyze the spatial distribution of nickel and other toxic elements in the United States. Again, what you can see here is that the, the uh, distribution of toxic elements such as nickel is not random. You have the, the red areas of high nickel concentration associated with well-defined zones in, uh, on the map. This is also uh, just, this slide emphasizes uh, the zones of high nickel concentration in the United States. However, my most recent and right now, uh, based on these results, uh, the Chinese geological survey also invited me and my colleagues, as you can see in the picture in the lower left corner. I've been working in the last few years with Chinese colleagues and also the Global uh, Geochemical Mapping uh, Institute uh, operated in Beijing under the United Nations that we use uh, uh, the Chinese data. And you can see in this map in the middle for copper. And you can see that copper concentration in the surface environment shown by the red uh, dots uh, in the map here is not random. So that's where you can uh, expect high uh, copper toxic uh, exposure to human health. So this is how you can come mapping helps uh, uh, the medical experts to, to, to find risky areas. This is just an example from Hungary. Again, this is uh, we used principal component analysis uh, and various mathematical methods to identify the geomical regions of Hungary. So then you, you, you see that the, the, blue, the, the blue area in the western part, where we have chromium, nickel, and, uh, and the cobalt uh, high concentration association due to the alpine geology, while the yellow area in the middle is a calcium, magnesium, strontium, a carbonatic area where you can uh, expect associated geochemistry in the food, in the soil, in the groundwater, the surface water. So finally, I jump to the health risk of uh, an example of, of projects of radon and gamma radiation. So uh, as again, I want to call your attention to uh, the European Union law. There is a, a European Union directive, which I think is also enforced in Turkey, for example, is that which requires the mapping, the geogen mapping of, of ionizing radiation is called the geogenic radiation in terms of radon and, uh, and gamma radiation in whole Europe. I think the deadline was last year. Uh, I really don't know. <laughs> but nevertheless, the question is what to measure is radon concentration, gamma radiation, and how in construction materials requires and the soil and water and, and also in the air. And then according to European Union law, the dwelling in urban areas, public buildings and workplaces, the red on concentration and gum radiation must be mapped and reported to Brussels and shared in the European Union to find shared solution. So here's an example for the spatial analysis of, uh, 
of uh, anterior my, my published papers as well, using various mathematical methods based on the measured data, it's possible to identify spatial structure. Also, uh, the monitoring is also required by European Union law. And here on the right, you see as a time series of radon concentration in, in uh, various, uh, uh, from August, September, October, and a whole longer year. And you can see here that also the temporal distribution of radon, for example, uh, is not random. It has a, has a seasonal variation. So the monitoring and sampling depends on the season. This was an, it is a published paper. I am very glad to uh, share with you. So that the spatial pattern, the temporal pattern of radiation in terms of spatial and temporal monitoring requires advanced mathematical methods, which are shown here, uh, which is called signal processing methods. My field, actually, my field of, of modeling is required for uh, uh, medical ge geology. Here's an example, and this is one of my last examples. I'm closing sh soon my presentation. Is uh, Budapest is in the middle, not the scale. This is some 80 kilometers in the south, 80 by 80 kilometer area. Budapest, the capital of Hungary. Here you have the river Danube, the large running north south. However, most important is the, the orange dots show the 142 sample locations when we uh, we sampled, uh, actually we measured gamma radiation on site, geogenic gamma radiation and radon concentration. In this case, let's uh, uh, focus on the gamma radiation. And again, using various mathematical methods, uh, what, we, sorry, what we did here is, uh, you can see on the right that we could identify spatial patterns. In this case, south, east, north, west, running high gamma radiation zones, uh, uh, which is again, the gamma dish is not random, which means if you have your house here or your grandmother's house here on this high zone, it's more risky area than uh, somewhere else. And not surprisingly, uh, as a, this uh, ma uh, map shows on the left, you can see that along this zone, there's a big fracture zone, a brick fault zone running the same direction, exposing granitic areas, as we know geologists, in granite tend to uh, accumulate uranium and the radon is a uh, uh, decay product of, of uranium. So then we found the geology, uh, a reason behind this spatial, uh, almost 100 kilometer uh, gamma radiation um, anomaly. And this is the paper we published, I'm ready to share with you upon your request. And this is, uh, so, so this was gamma radiation, sorry, sorry, this was gamma radiation. Now let's take a look at the radon at the, for the same data set. So, uh, however, uh, what we found using uh, different mathematical and spatial analysis methods that uh, while, uh, just going back now, sorry, uh, for the gamma radiation, you have the gamma radiation uh, anomaly is south, west, north, east. Here for the radon uh, 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 anomaly, as you can see on the upper right corner, I'm just blinking these uh, trends, is just the perpendicular from the southeast to the northwest in Hungary, uh, sorry, in the, in, in the area of Budapest. Uh, uh, so this may, however, radon is, is associated with the superficial distribution of sediments on the top. So this means that you have to understand geology, geochemistry, and the data management in order to identify spatial distribution of the toxic elements uh, or, or radiation to assist the medical experts to find high risk areas. And of course, this has been also published internationally, ready for distribution. Now, another scale for a recent study here is a granitic area also in Hungary, but this is only three kilometers area. And this very small area, we collected 300, uh, uh, we took 300 measurements, as you can see on the dots on the right, the gray, uh, gray picture here, uh, 300 uh, measurements of gamma radiation. And on the right, you see the granitic area in the, the, with, with the pink color. And what you can see here is that I'm blinking here the, the, the various, um, various dike zones, uh, which are high concentration of granitic materials, I'm telling for the non-geologists this, uh, from the south, east, northwest, and just perpendicular direction, you have the fault lines. So the question is, which is the geological structure which guides the spatial distribution of gamma radiation in this uh, granitic area? 
I know that in Turkey, you have a lot of nice granitic areas and uranium uh, mines and as I said, environmental problems. Uh, so here is just without the details, again, using various mathematical methods, uh, image processing it's called, or uh, signal processing methods. What is important here is that again, that we see in this map that the gamma radiation in space is not random. The, these blue arrows blinking here show uh, that the gamma radiation has a southeast, northwest, uh, sorry, southwest, northeast direction, uh, which is associated with the dikes, the di direction. So the gamma radiation is associated with the, with the underlying uh, dikes of specific linear geological features of this granitic area. So not the fault, but the dikes. Again, it has been recently published, I think last year. Uh, I'm most glad to send this paper to you. And finally, let me jump to the Water Frame Directive. Uh, I guess uh, I'm sure that everybody's aware of the Water Frame Directive of the European Union. We had a project, I just wanted to show you that we analyzed this European Geological uh, Expert Group uh, I'm a member of. We analyzed the bottled water chemistry in Europe and we published a book and papers and uh, we found very interesting patterns of contamination because remember, water is the number one food for a human intake. People forget water is the number of uh, food for humans, therefore the number one source of possible medical problems in terms of contamination. Now, most exciting is uh, this project, and this is my most recent one, and that's my, that's my last slide, the Simona project. This is a European Union project for the Danube Basin, certain countries are involved. And this is the sediment quality information and monitoring and risk assessment uh, uh, project. As you know, the Water Infrared Directive requires from now, from actually from this year, 2021, that not only the water, the surface and groundwater, let's talk about surface water, quality has to be monitored, like in Turkey, I know that you do this, but the sediment also. So the river sediment has to be sampled regularly from now on and analyzed for risk assessment. But this is how we geologists, geochemists, we really know, uh, I guess now you are convinced uh, based on the previous examples, how to collect uh, and where to collect uh, representative uh, sediment samples, how to analyze. And this project is about this. I am the scientific coordinator of this project. This is 1.72 million euro project. So just an example here uh, that uh, how in a river to collect uh, the, the sediment sample, the upper five centimeter, which is actually the risk zone where the biota leaves, where the contamination accumulates. So collecting the upper five centimeter in a river is not a trivial task. We, uh, in this project, we developed a sampling protocol for whole European Union, but then you base indefinitely. We developed then the laboratory protocol and then the risk assessment protocol. I'm very glad to share with this you. And this is my invitation to all the experts uh, to join and contribute to this uh, activity. So here is a section you can see here on the left. Uh, that the sediment is not homogeneous. So at depths, you can see the dark color, high organic matter, more toxic elements, but on the top it's gray, it's more oxidized. It's less toxic elements uh, you expect in the sediment. So the question is, which part we should sample in order to report and save your people, your child, you know, or your family members who are entering a lake or a river, you know, innocently, and they are not aware if it's dangerous or not. So that is the sampling methods. Uh, this is an interesting uh, issue. I, I understand that uh, this meeting is also followed by engineers. It's a bit of, uh, this is actual technology. This is called artificial fi uh, fish, but uh, actually this is a passive sampler. So then uh, you use uh, this white little, it's a membrane, it's an absorbent. You, you uh, uh, sink this underwater. You wait one week, two weeks, and this absorbent absorbs the heavy metal Box and pesticide specifically, and then uh, you can take this to the laboratory to analyze. They're also testing this methodology. This is a German product. And here is flat plain sediment. Remember, in the European Union projects, we, we, uh, we collected flat plain sediments, the European Union mapping project. So here is how to collect a flat plain sediment. So I'm calling your attention that we don't go only for the the uh, inorganic, you know, uh, heavy metal contamination, but also organic box and pesticides have to be sampled. So therefore we have to use the unusual uh, glass container for samples on the right. This is also new to me because I never sampled before for organic contaminants. And on the upper right, you see a specific sampler we are testing. 
that you easily and fast you can uh, sample the upper five centimeter uh, representatively uh, of the soil of the sediment in the flat plate. So, uh, uh, so and that's laboratory testing of contamination risk assessment. So again, pox, pesticides, and metals defined by the European Union law, the water from directive, you have to analyze not only the water but in the sediment from now on. So we are testing these methods. This is the laboratory. We collected the soil suspended sediments in barrels, you know, in the river. And then we use various filtering techniques to filter shoot a 0.45 micron to have the water and the suspended sediments, which can be toxic. The fish, for example, the biota uh, swimming or you when you are swimming in the water, uh, taking a bath, you, your body, you are digesting this, uh, you are exposed to this uh, contaminated suspended sediment. How to filter this, how to analyze in the laboratory. And uh, this is just an example for the laboratory testing. This is ongoing. So again, I invite anybody to join and contribute to this ongoing project. And then uh, another project, an example uh, is ongoing. Uh, this is the bilateral project between Slovenia and Hungary, which has been mentioned in the introduction. Thank you for the introduction. How, uh, this is the Drava River. This is a 300 kilometer river between, uh, in the north we have Hungary, in the south we have Croatia and Slovenia. And you can see that the red color uh, is the high cadmium concentration, which shows that the cadmium concentration, at first it shows that the whole flat plain, which is agricultural areas, rich agricultural areas are contaminated by historic mining cadmium. That's, that's number one, regional contamination. Second is that uh, it does agricultural areas, so the, the cadmium has a likelihood to reach the human body through uh, food intake and digestion. So again, here's examples, international group, how we take samples on coring in the flat plains, and we take uh, active channel sediments, and uh, active flat plains and the terrace samples as well uh, to again to analyze the risk of contamination in these agricultural areas. And uh, here again, this uh, slide shows that we, we went there with microbiologists. Actually, I, I, of course, I knew that microbes have a key role in, in, uh, uh, in toxic element, you know, um, circulation in soils and sediments. However, now we are working closely with microbiologists and it turned out that microbes have a primary role of controlling the distribution and the speciation, remember, the chemical form of toxic elements available for human intake and for the plant uptake in the continent areas. Microbiology, remember this word. So finally, uh, we have a European Union project uh, on the food origin and safety. So it shouldn't be a surprise, uh, after this, uh, the end of this presentation as a conclusion that uh, the food uh, safety is a global issue. When you enter you know, your shop you know, near your home, you buy Chinese rice, you buy Italian wine, uh, you buy uh, you know, Turkish uh, orange, and you buy you know, uh, Spanish apple. And the question is, is it toxic or not? Is it dangerous? And that's what your government wants to know. That's what the customer wants to know. What is its origin? And is it uh, the French wine is really uh, okay for in terms of toxic elements? So this is the project. And the, the idea is that based on the geographical maps, which I showed you here in chromium, so is it true that you have high uh, concentration of chromium, for example, uh, in this case, as an, as an example shown by the red uh, areas, also tend that, uh, that, for example, in this case, apple as a fruit takes up this uh, chromium. Let's take a closer look at uh, this project, which is actually right now ongoing. In April, we are going to the field to collect these samples. It's a really hot topic. But you can see here is the apple. What is really interesting is that uh, we analyzed the soil uh, concentration, the, the, the toxic on the soil, and in the uh, fruits, in the seed, in the flesh, as you can see on the picture, right, and in the peel. And what is interesting is that, for example, for zinc and chromium, you can see here uh, the, the vertical axis is the concentration of the element. And horizontally, you see the three groups of, uh, of uh, flesh, peel, and seed. And you can see here that, for example, zinc is accumulated uh, in apple in the seed. However, chromium tends to accumulate in the flesh. So which means that if you want to analyze the toxicity or the effect, it's not only the fruit altogether, but it depends which part, you know, uh, you, uh, you, the particular plant or fruit in this case, 
uh, is accumulated. So it's not homogeneous. And then uh, uh, let me give you another uh, example here. We have apple, but we also sampled pear. On the left, you see for the zinc, apple and pear. And you can see here that a zinc tends to accumulate in the seed for pear, another type of, of fruit, much more than in apple. So there's a difference between uh, the various uh, fruit types as well. Uh, this spring in April, we are going to the, uh, sorry, in, uh, we are going to the field, of course, but in, in, in August, uh, uh, we will go to the field again and collect cherry. We will test cherry and potato and paprika as well in this European Union project. Uh, so then uh, in conclusion, uh, we can say that uh, as you can see, that uh, the environment, we have the global uh, element uh, circles or geochemical biogeochemical cycles anyway. And we humans are a part of these cycles. So I think we can conclude and we have to be aware and we have to teach our next generation, their children, that the man and his environment is a single unity, uni unity and using geology and medical geology and geochemistry and medical sciences together can study these processes and then can provide solutions to improve our life standards. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, dear Jordan. Thank you so yeah, much, Jordan. Sir, it was excellent uh, talk. Uh, we learned many things about uh, uh, different contamination in different parts of the country. But it was interesting. Uh, we learned that uh, high concentration arsenic in the Hungary, mm. and then also it is thank you for uh, you know that mentioning the different element in the different regions related with human health. But it was is a nice to also show some data about uh, uh, accumulation of the heavy metal in the food. It's, it's yeah. quite interesting. Uh, I think some of our colleagues have uh, some question. Now I'm going to do. Uh, just chest checks uh, thank you and uh, now one question many people say that thank you very much they, they yeah, are, yeah my yeah. pleasure thank you uh, uh, one of the question uh, from the uh, we are happy now because in our participant we have many doctor also sure uh, yeah the, I know uh, one of the doctors say that thank you for your comprehensive conference did you mm -hmm. investigate the causative relation between surface radon level and lung cancer risk in living environment. Uh, yeah. the, the other one mm -hmm. are lung, lung cancer and mesothelioma due to environment asbestos and aerionic exposure subject to the medical geology as a scientific interest area. They have two questions. Right, thank you for your interest and uh, for the questions. Answering the first one, uh, I know I'm not, a, I'm not actually a radon expert and uh, especially not the radon, radon medical expert, but of course I work with these medical guys and, uh, and experts, uh, colleagues, uh, very nicely. What I understand is that, uh, that uh, of course as the medical audience is very aware, that there has been a lot of studies, and I think now it's very well understood the link of radon and the lung cancer. So uh, there are already a uh, mathematical formula how to calculate the, the radon risk of cancer. So therefore, uh, the European Union law, which uh, the new law which I uh, showed you for the requiring the, the mapping of the geogenic radon and gamma, and also uh, this is the, how's it called, the, uh, the outdoor, and the, the indoor uh, uh, risk, but this is the outdoor risk. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this piece of legislation already uh, assumes that this uh, link between the radon and the lung cancer is already you know, a sort of known relationship. So this uh, piece of legislation does not ask for the specific study of this link, but already based on the research so far requires only to, to map the spatial distribution of radon. And they have a formula, I can, this is a geogenic formula. It's in the paper, I'm ready to share with you. It's a formula which tells you the, actually the risk. So if you measure a certain amount of radon in your soil practically, uh, in a certain figure, a certain concentration, 
Then uh, using this formula, you can already estimate the, the human has risk, a potential risk of, of radon. Okay. Uh, however, uh, specifically answering the question, I have not carried out any explicit study to link the spatial distribution of radon, for example, in the case study in Hungary and the, and the uh, lung cancer, uh, you know, spatial distribution in Hungary. That would be very interesting to do, by the way. Thank you for your question. The second question, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the second question. Can you just <laughs> briefly... The uh, question about the lung cancer. They say that our lung cancer and mesothelioma due to environment asbestos mm -hmm. and aeronid explored to the subject to the medical geology as a site of interest area. So yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Absolutely. So actually, as 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 uh, you, Professor Chairman, you you, you mentioned uh, in your uh, uh, revealing introduction that uh, the conferences like this one and the opportunities of this one are excellent opportunities. Exactly to bring together the even closer the medical experts and geology geochemistry experts, indeed to answer uh, uh, more in depth such such questions. Uh, I think we are all aware that medical geology is a very new subject, so it's a, there are big gaps in our knowledge. Actually, we are, we, are, we have we have more uh, lack of understanding than we do understand. This is the this is the truth. So any study, uh, specific study uh, 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 or research studying uh, such an uh, in-depth relationship between uh, the geochemistry uh, and, uh, and human health is more than welcome because we have, we have very limited understanding of these issues. Thank you for your question. Okay, thank you. The other question from uh, Ayşe Gülçetin, uh, she said that she wants to know that especially carbon dioxide emission from the geothermal power generation. She said that, could you please give an, an advice and remark about the carbon dioxide causes emitted from geothermal system? Right, yes, thank you for the question. I would be very glad to give, but it's, I'm afraid it's, it's not my uh, field of uh, expertise. Uh, I work primarily with uh, toxic elements, you know, uh, and of course some of the organic uh, contaminants most recently in the sediment project, but uh, the carbon dioxide emission is not my uh, field of interest. Unfortunately, I cannot comment or, or answer this question. However, through the organizers, I'm most glad uh, to guide you to experts, international experts, and you make and get you uh, in link with the experts who can answer your questions and promote cooperation with you in this field. Thank you. Dr. Okay, Baba. Thank, you. thank you very much. Yes, see, please. We, we have uh, some question uh, from Reis mm -hmm. I think... Uh, One of our station, Reis Dent, Umut Ağa Çapanoğlu. Yes, Umut Çapanoğlu. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we are hearing you. Uh, first of all, thanks. First of all, I want to thank you so much about that uh, presentation because it's one of the, my main interests. Like, uh, as an hydrogeology engineer who likes uh, these kind of topics, uh, mm -hmm. we talked about inorganics, mostly like uh, endogangetic basin and some others which suffer from mm -hmm. arsenic and some others. Uh, I know this uh, was about it was about uh, food security, water security, and some others. But mm -hmm. uh, I want to mention some uh, others, if you... Sure, sure. And NAPL and DNAPLs uh, from, uh, you know, some petroleum things and industrial areas also mm -hmm. uh, affects that thing so much. So I want to ask that, I mean, also vaporization from these DNAPL and NAPLs. Uh, I want to ask, what is their place and importance in these studies, like uh, organic contamination? Well, uh, thank you very, very much for your question. You know, I'm a geologist and geochemist myself, so you know, I put my primary focus on um, inorganic uh, uh, geochemistry, the periodic table, basically. But recently, you know, as I exposed in my running projects, I, I turned, I, have, I had to turn uh, to the organic uh, contamination such as pesticides and pox and so on, because the European Union legislation, as you know, uh, the water directive specifically requires to study these in uh, sediments. So then um, I'm not an expert of, or, uh, of organic uh, contaminants. However, 
I have to tell you that uh, that uh, the uh, so according to the waterfront directive, then uh, two things uh, you we have to uh, focus on. One is the at the receptor part, the, the environmental monitoring uh, is required, and that was my project to require to uh, which I showed to you uh, to sample the surface water and surface uh, sediments for organic chemical compounds. But however. Now you have a high organic, uh, for example, pesticides contamination of a certain sediment, you don't know where it comes from, from the upstream area. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing. However, there are other projects, huge projects, which, which are actually uh, targeting the other side of basically the risk is the source. And this is called the hazardous substances uh, uh, aspect, if you want, or programs. And uh, so the source, as you pointed out very well, I. Also, I'm a you know, field geologist myself. Actually, uh, as a scientist, as a decision support scientist of the government, I, I fully agree with the European Union priority to prioritize the sources. Because if you stop the source, such as refineries, as you said, oil industry and other industries, we control or monitor the sources, the emissions, then uh, I think we, are, we, are, uh, we make a, a bigger step towards uh, protection. So, in brief and in conclusion, uh, we have a twin project, a European Union project, as of course in all governments are doing this, to monitor the, the, the emissions, the big em emissions of, for example, organic contamination of uh, oil refineries, for example, and of course all other industrial emissions. Uh, but it's not in my, uh, my immediate activity, it's not yet. So if you are interested in, I'm more than glad again, to uh, offer my uh, interaction to get you in touch with those guys who are uh, monitoring the hazardous substances emissions at industrial sites and also in, uh, for example, in uh, waste uh, repository sites. It would be great. Thank you. It will be really great for me. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you. Okay. After that, I will mention you if you want to. Sure, sure, sure. Send me an email. Okay. I think through Professor uh, Karapinar. Uh, or the organizers, you know, uh, uh, I guess that you, you can contact okay. me anytime. Also, I'm from, also, I'm from MTA, Hydrogeology Engineer. Ah, right, then. That's easy for you. <laughs> okay. okay, easy for you. Easy for me. Then. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, dear Georgian, mm -hmm. another question from the mm -hmm. Georgian top. She mm -hmm. said that uh, I was, uh, I, she has, one of the PhD students from Gyoza, Jordan, from this the is true. Pan Isvan University. This and is true. He was uh, also my co uh, advisor at the ET. Uh, mm -hmm. And then she asked mm -hmm. uh, how they are sampling for radon, which methodology they use. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, here, is, uh, here is the photograph. Uh, I, I hope you can see this. There's my share screen. The, where is this? The, uh, the radon is, yeah, the radon, uh, as you know, uh, I'm again not a, not a direct radon expert, but in the radon, you have basically two sampling methods the, uh, the passive sampling and uh, the active or non passive sampling. The passive sampling is that basically when you insert uh, 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 an absorbent. Basically, detector I would say, which is a film, and then you it's just a small box like a small box like this. You put mm -hmm. in uh, this is used the passive sample of radon is used primarily for indoor assessment. So then you put in your house, your workplace, and you leave it there inside it. That's not box. It's just it is a just show you it looks like this, and you have a sensor. It receives the radon in your in your from your kitchen or in your office. And then uh, for, for two weeks or whatever period, exposure period, uh, it uh, basically it's, it measures or collects, it's like a detector, uh, the radon, the cumulative radon, and then you put it in the laboratory and you analyze this. You can put also this into the soil, okay? And then you just put under the soil and then again for a, uh, a certain period of time, you leave it in the soil. Uh, this is... Uh, required uh, according to the standards of 80 centimeters, 80 eight centimeters below the surface. That's previous studies show that this is the representative uh, depth for geogenic radon. And then the other, the other, the other uh, method is actually shown in this slide on the left. When you uh, 
put a probe again, uh, just which is a rod basically under the under the uh, surface, and then you use a, a pump, basically a gas and air pump, as you can see here. So this is an active sampling, and then every 15 minutes, every one hour, uh, whenever interval, you are uh, basically the pump, you are sucking out the soil gas, all the gas, including radon, and then uh, uh, it, is, uh, it arrives into the detector. And then uh, if you put against time, you can see on the right here, you, get, you can reconstruct a nice uh, time series of fluctuating uh, radon exposure coming from the soil. So these are the two methods uh, used for radon uh, monitoring. Of course, my last comment, as far as I understand the radon community, there is some dispute, I would say, uh, as for the soil, which is the most rep more representative, the passive, which has advantages, uh, and uh, disadvantages against the active, the, the gas pump, which also has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, it's written in, in our paper. I'm very glad to share the published papers, which I showed to you. Thank you so ones. much. We have, Thank uh, you. We have one question from uh, Dr. John Aidai. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Aidai, you can open your uh, microphone. Is it okay? Yeah, it's okay. Please. We are hearing you. Sorry about. Okay, uh, Dr. Jordan, uh, I want to say my thanks first because it was very, very nice and very, very fruitful presentation. Uh, I want to ask, uh, I want to learn something because you mentioned that collection is very important than analyzing these uh, samples and uh, then mapping is very important. Uh, I am sitting on this uh, stage. Uh, I am interested about uh, GIS and geostatistical part of mm. this uh, uh, analyzing and uh, modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to ask you, uh, what was the grid size for uh, Europe European project uh, which you uh, showed uh, your presentation? And right. Right. Uh, thank you for your question. Actually, we had two European uh, projects. Uh -huh. uh, one was, do you, you hear me? Uh, one was the uh, this global geographical mapping pro uh, uh, program, uh -huh. and uh, and then uh, within this program, the whole Earth, sur Earth's, Earth's surface is divided by a 160 kilometer square cells. One six zero. Okay. Square cells, and within each cell, randomly, but the whole Earth, okay, so from so the whole Earth, including Turkey, uh, uh, five sub sub five points are selected randomly, and five small catchments. So then you just randomly you, you selected five points, and then each cell, basically five samples are collected in uh, small uh, catchments. So the uh, stream water at the catchment out at location, stream water and stream sediment. Flat plain sediment, top and bottom soil, and uh, yeah, yes, yeah. so, yeah, stream sediment, stream water, flat plain sediment, top mm -hmm. soil, bottom soil. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so this is the resolution. But for the Gamma's project, sorry, and this was okay. an even larger project because Ukraine and more countries took part. This was the fifty by fifty kilometer, mm -hmm. uh, uh, much higher resolution uh, uh, survey. This data is available, I think, free from the internet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And my second question is, uh, did you use uh, the same algorithm for each element or you uh, for use different algorithm for uh, most of them? It's a very good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. That's uh, really good. So then, uh, yeah, absolutely. So that's, the, the thing is that the concept is the same. So the, for analyzing the, the spatial distribution, we use geotastistics, image mm -hmm. processing, whatever method. However, as it's a very good, very good point. Since the spatial distribution, and this is one of the major outcomes of these, uh, what you can see here, the, the, these uh, uh, projects, is that, as you said, very important, the different elements have absolutely different uh, spatial behavior. So for example, mercury is very local. So you have local anomalies. 
local anomalies, high concentrations. But you can see in this picture, uh, Nika, for example, has you know, almost transcontinental spatial patterns, which means, and that's my answer to your question, that uh, although the same concept, signal processing methods you use, however, you have to be very careful uh, which you know, exact methodology you use for you know, highly various mercury, for example, or nickel, because the, their spatial behavior is very different. Thank you for your question. Thank you. That's yeah, really- You are welcome. And my last que question, uh, you showed uh, a sensor, a uh, radon sensor, uh, and uh, you told us uh, it's possible to put the sensor in indoors and also outdoors. Uh, uh, does sense. this sensor has transmitter? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to send uh, data directly to uh, to uh, main gate? I mean. Well, thank you very much. For the positive sample, uh, to my best knowledge, is not. It's not. For, however, for this pumping uh, technique, which I show you the, in, in the slide, again, in the lower le uh, left corner, I think it's po it, it is possible uh, to make it automatic, although I'm not aware uh, of if th there is, because basically uh, the, 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 the radon sensor attached to this pump is also you just live in the field or wherever you live, and it's it measures you know takes in a little processor computer takes you know the in the memory it takes the samples, but of course it is digital. Uh, it is possible to transfer. However, in this European project, which has, which I think was here, this one in this project uh, we are which is running now uh, not for radon but for other toxic elements. We are testing indeed. Uh, automatic sensors of toxic elements, which are using uh, mobile phone or satellite, you know, transmission uh, on your mobile phone, you can see every 15 minutes, the measurements of, of I think that's the future. Online so the online monitoring is the future. Online communication. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your good question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Jordan, we have Another one question. Sure, this go question ahead. About to mercury. Mm -hmm. it, what, what type of the geological units consists of mercury? How can it affect our health? The question. Yeah, very good question. Mercury is uh, is, is tricky, as we know. And then uh, when I mentioned speciation, so the form mm -hmm. or the actually the chemical bond or chemical form or chemical bond of the chemical elements depends on the toxicity. Uh, so that the toxicity depends on the chemical bond or the chemical form or the speciation. These are the same terms for the same thing. Uh, it depends on uh, the toxicity such as arsenic I mentioned, but this is chromium as we know the same and mercury. So then uh, for example, and this is reflected in the new European Union law that uh, since a couple of years now, the waterfront directive which is also in place in Turkey uh, now you have to measure total mercury concentration in water, but now you have to measure methyl mercury in water, which means uh, mercury bound to organic compounds, the organic, uh, organic bound mercury, which is much more toxic than, uh, than metal mercury. So then, uh, uh, therefore, the toxicity of mercury is very much dependent on its chemical uh, speciation or bond. And if it is bound to organic matter, which is called methylated mercury uh, or methyl mercury is highly toxic, uh, but there is, all, there is a uh, environmental standard in terms of concentration uh, in the waterfront directive. This directive is called, you, is, you can download it from the uh, internet, it's called the uh, the EQS uh, directive, the, the environmental quality standards, just type in the, and then you get this directive. In the annex, you will see uh, the environmental standards in water, a different one for total mercury if you want, and then a different uh, environmental risk standard, you know, microgram per uh, liter for uh, methyl mercury. That's one thing. The second thing is, that globally, and that's my, my last uh, sentence to answer this question, that globally it's very exciting because it seems that also our studies in China and also study in the geochemical maps in, in China and in Europe shows, but I guess uh, mercury experts are aware that uh, the great deal of the global cycle of mercury is atmospheric. 
So uh, uh, the high concentration is very, can be very local for mercury in mining areas, for example, in volcanic areas, for example, in soils and rock. However, the large distribution of, of mercury is, comes from the air. So then uh, there's a big global cycle of mercury, which is distributed globally. So for example, I'll give you an example. If you take a look at the mercury uh, map of, uh, of topsoil of the, in Europe, you will see that there's a mercury anomaly at the seaside where the wind, the global, you know, the wind is blowing mercury uh, towards the mainland and then it's first deposited close to the sea, of course, and then is decreasing towards the mainland. So this is actually reflected in the, in the topsoil mercury geographical maps already. So it's airborne to a great deal. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. We have one, one more question uh, from uh, Dear Dunmas. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Koza. Mm -hmm. Nice to see you here. Mm -hmm. Maybe you remembered we uh, discussed in our office about Turkish geochemical mapping project. I several... remember, oh, yes, yeah, I, I remember, yes. Of course. Several years ago uh, with um, Nuray, Dr. Nuray and uh, Dr. Pinakrikadi. Yeah, uh -huh. I was a unit manager at that time. Uh, now also I am uh, uh, head of mineral research and exploration department. Very we, good. Uh, thank you. We finished our <coughs> geochemical mapping project uh, in 2019. Mm -hmm. We collect 145,000 uh, samples from... I know, it was very ambitious, I know. ...all around Turkey. Uh, we collect uh, from each five square kilometers for, for one samples high resolution maps from uh, Europe or other uh, uh, countries. Mm -hmm. It is regional geochemical mapping. Also, we finished our global geochemical mapping project with our Chinese colleagues together. Ah, Chinese, sure. I'm, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, as you know, I yeah, thank you. As you know, our main goal for mineral exploration, uh, mm -hmm. we, we want to use our geochemical mapping for mineral exploration. Mm -hmm. But uh, at that time, we are we we want to use our data for medical geology with uh, Chamber of Geological Engineering uh, sure. <laughs> Medical Geology uh, Study Group. Uh, we want to combine uh, our geochemical data and medical medical data uh, from uh, uh, mm -hmm. ministry. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in this scope, what is your advice us? Yes. Yeah, well, actually, I'm, I'm aware that in Turkey you have one of the most ambitious and high resolution geochemical maps. I'm really congratulations. Uh, of course, I follow this uh, progress, and I'm very glad that you also work with uh, my Chinese colleagues, uh, which is good. Uh, one thing uh, for medical geology uh, that uh, and bigger geology. So the problem is that, uh, that's not the problem. So there's no problem. Okay. So the issue is, I would say. Mm -hmm. That of course, as we know, that we have these maps and uh, the map of the like the geochemical map you mentioned, okay, the distribution in the surface environment of the chemical elements, and then you may have a map of the spatial distribution of uh, different diseases. Yes, <laughs> but uh, uh, and there are a lot of studies where there is real link between, obviously. However, the, the link is not so evident always. Uh, for two reasons. One is because the complexity of the human body. So, you know, in what form you eat or take, even the soil, children in the playgrounds, you know, a lot of, in the, a lot of uh, studies about this, they really know, they tend to eat the soil, you know. When I was a kid, I was with the soil. But even, even that, in that direct contact, uh, it's not necessarily, uh, it's risky. This is one thing. So it's very complex. It's a very complex digestion, you know, biological issue. That's one thing. The... The, the, the second is that most of, uh, most of the contamination, the great deal goes through food. And right now, uh, right now, uh, right now, uh, uh, the, the food is, is, is really local. So it's globalization, you know, the food industry is global, but even within your country, my country, you know, for example, in Ankara, I know that you eat uh, fish, you know, from the very nice fish, actually, very good fish. But it's, it's not taken, it's not, it wasn't taken in Ankara, it was taken, you know, hands of Clinton's away, right? So just an example that the food that you eat daily, you know, is, has zero link, you know, to where you live. And also the, the, the people are very mobile, you know, 
Yes. So even yes. if you spend your childhood, your chant, you spend your childhood in a uranium area, you know, radon, your lung is uh, already destroyed, and you have a cancer or a high risk of <coughs> cancer, but then you move to another place, you know, wherever, okay, Ankara, wherever, where there's no uranium, okay, and your illness develops later, you know, a few years later in your in your lifetime. So therefore, because of the people are very mobile, you know, uh, you know, in our modern society, it's increasingly hard to detect the spatial link. So we had, I have to confess that in Hungary, at least we had, uh, when I was working for the Hungary Energy Survey, uh, we had projects which failed. You know, we had nice geochemical maps. We had, we, we tested the blood, the hair, you know, these are the typical, you know, indicators of, of health and urine. And we very rarely, or we, we found only very locally some link between, you know, of the spatial distribution, some of the chemical, you know, contaminants. And this is because, you know, even the food, you know, even the, the water comes from bottled water from absolute different place. So you don't have the groundwater contact with the rock, you know, but you're, you're let's say, as 50 years ago or a century ago. So this makes uh, increasingly hard, you know, to study this link, you know, between the human health and the spatial distribution. So that's my advice, that when you team up with the medical guys, uh, we, we geologists understand geology and geochemistry, but the medical guys with whom you work should be very much aware of this socio-economy. This is al almost not a medical issue, it's a sociological, economic issue, how the food, how the water, how the living standards, you know, uh, you know are, are moving. That's very important. That's my ad advice or suggestion. Thank you. <laughs> you are right. Thank you, thank you. Very good question, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, dear Dr. Jordan. Uh, I have a just, uh, again, uh, two small questions. One of them mm. is about uh, GIS information, about mm. the methods. They say that which type of method you use for the mapping, you know that? For the uh, yes, yeah. Well, that's tricky. So be, basically, this is called, uh, so in terms of mathematics, this is called, uh, there's a lot of names for this. This is called, uh, let's say, uh, in the broader sense, this is called data mining. That's one word, data mining or exploratory data analysis, or it is called also pattern recognition. It depends which field you are, but the same thing. Or signal processing, that's more engineering, or uh, now it's called big data, you know, and uh, data mining, these are the modern words, but the same thing, basically. And uh, sometimes it's called artificial intelligence, uh, uh, but this is the same, uh, basically more or less same. Actually, uh, for recognizing pattern, like in this Chinese map, uh, we uh, use uh, the same methods actually, what your mobile phone is using when you take a picture. This is image processing methods. Well, in, in this field it's called image processing. It's when, for example, you know that you take a photo and any mo modern eye, uh, mobile phone can do this, that you recognize your face. And then, you know, you have funny or less funny pictures on you and so on. Uh, or recognizes your face and whatever pictures. Uh, we use exactly the same methods with the computer. So when to identify edges, like for example, the your face, edge of your face, but this is an edge of different uh, mm -hmm. uh, concentrations in the map, for example, okay? But the same edge, so where is the edge, okay? Where are the animals, like your eyes, you know? Okay, I'll just give you an example. I have a special uh, 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 training course on these specific methods, but anyway, your eyes, is the same numerical methods are used for a computer to record as well as your eyes. But when is your, this red anomaly, you know, this, which is a, a local feature in this Chinese map, for example. So we use exactly the same method. It's called image processing methodology, basically. And of course, for the multivariate analysis, we use principal components, analysis, and artificial intelligence, neural network, and so on and so forth. Uh, methodology, but this is the primary technique. We are actually we are not modeling, so then we are, on, we are just recognizing patterns so far. The modeling would be that when we recognize these patterns, that you have high, let's say, I think this is a copper map, high copper, and then how, the, for example, through erosion, with erosion, this high concentration or concentrated, uh, contaminated soil, how it is, for example, through rainfall, whatever, is deposited, you know, at lowland areas, for example. That would be real modeling. We do, I have published papers about this in mining areas for catchment uh, modeling, but honestly, uh, I would not, or I'm, although I'm a modeler, I would not call these techniques uh, modeling.
modeling, I would call this more pattern recognition or exploratory or data mining uh, methods. Image processing is called. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I think this is uh, the last question. They said that uh, rail elements are increasing is an important today, the, one of the questions. They said rail, that yes, it's yes, possible sorry. to use to enrich rail elements by plants. Do you know that question? Yes, sure. So then what I want to show is this project here, this project. So the rare earth elements and uh, I would also add isotopes. I haven't mentioned, I didn't want to overcomplicate my presentation, but indeed, uh, and one of the, the, the previous questions uh, attached this issue, I think with, with, uh, with uh, oil refineries in terms of organic contamination, the source and the receptor. So here we are studying the receptors. We have to monitor by European Union law, I think also in Turkey, to sample and monitor the receiving sediments in, in, in waters, I told you. However, uh, uh, also the water from directive says that the sediment can be used to detect, as we geochemists, you, of course, you know, the, the potential source. So obviously, if, if your catchment, your water body is called in uh, the water from directive, the water body or catchment, you have a mining area, it's a, it has a very high probability that the high uh, metal contamination that you uh, sampled in your uh, sediment downstream comes through the mining area. It's obvious. Uh, uh, however, uh, in order to identify, when you take a sample to identify what is the source, it's called fingerprinting. Also for the food, by the way. For, so your apple or your French wine really comes from, from France or your Italian very expensive olive oil comes from Italy or from Greece. It's not the same thing, it's business, you know. And then uh, my answer is yes, uh, rare earth elements, but even better uh, isotopes, stable isotopes, the isotope ratio, the ratio uh, seems to be the most efficient way of fingerprinting, which means identifying uh, the possible source. So it means that you, are, you measure the rare earth element ratios, and the stable isotope ratios in your sediment sample. And then you, you, you take the same uh, analysis in the possible sources in your catchment, you know, metal industry, refinery, whatever. And so they have the fingerprinting and then you match these fingerprints of the source, the, the emission, and here what you sample in the receptor. And if you have a match of these ratios, rare elements and isotopes, I think you have a high likelihood to, to, to identify what is the source of contamination? A very good question, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, okay, so I have a many questions now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 sure, sure, that's why we are here. Yeah. Uh, the one I'm of, very glad actually. Yeah, 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 many people interested in this one. Uh, the one of them is uh, the question come from the Nurai Karepnar. Mm -hmm. uh, I think she wants to just talk to you. Uh, Nurai Hanum? Hey. Uh, yes, uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Alper. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, uh, thank you to you, uh, Guyoza, for accepting uh, my request uh, to do a webinar. Thank you, thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, my my question is that, uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Jahid uh, said, that mm -hmm. MTA has a very nice uh, data based on stream sediments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I am wondering how uh, can we use these, these data uh, or what is the meaning of these data in uh, geochemistry studies, uh, uh, environmental geochemistry studies or uh, medical geology studies? Uh, uh, for example, uh, can we use these data uh, to figure out the uh, geochemical background of the land, for example. Mm. What wow. is the meaning of this sediment data uh, from an uh, environmental point of view? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nurai. I, I like your good questions. You know, I remember that you always had very good questions, you know, which shows a good understanding. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a very that's an essential question. And that's what we are yeah, testing here in this project. So the, how the stream, so this is a stream sediment, actually core sediment upper five centimeter, but you see the deeper sediment, you have a passive sample in the water, you have the flat plate sediment, it's other media. And I showed you, I think, suspended sediment here in this picture. <laughs> so uh, 
indeed, uh, what you asked is a fundamental issue. So which is the sampling media, which sample, which is representative to a certain process? And that's still a debate. So for example, uh, some, some people, you know, based on this European Union law, of course, they say that flat plain sediment should not be uh, collected only the stream sediment, but you in Turkey collect it. And we in geochemists, we all, most often, we collect the stream sediment, the, the bottom sediment in the water channel, underwater, basically. So what it re represents? What is the suspended sediment it represents? Besides the suspended sediment, when you have a flood, basically, when the flood plain sediment is basically suspended sediment, you know, deposited on the flat plain over a bank. You know, uh, when the flood, the water just removes, the sediment is deposited. So it's basically the suspended sediment during uh, uh, flood event. So these are very big issues. And I fully agree that uh, uh, you have to be very careful uh, how you, in which sampling media, to, for what objective, for what purpose you want to uh, uh, interpret. Uh, for example, I'll give you one more example. We have a very big debate uh, in Brussels, uh, experts, you know, European Union uh, uh, experts, uh, that what the stream sediment represents in terms of health risk and uh, ecological risk, okay? So uh, the ecologists say, so this is a built in geochemistry, I would say the ecologists, we have an international dispute within the water further active context, a very high level, very important context. So the stream sediment uh, you mentioned in, in Turkey, for example, when you take a sample and then you uh, analyze it, okay, does it really represent or is, is, is good to represent the whole water body, the whole catchment, okay, and contamination? Or, and that's what we geologists say, but the ecologists say, no, 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 it represents only that local, you know, situation where you have the biota, the fish, you know, fish, and the mussels and the shells and you know various you know living organisms uh, you know are living in this. That's why we, we sampled up for five centimeter. That they uh, and that's it's relevant only very locally, okay? Because they live there, you know, in that very spot. So, uh, so this is a very very important issue, and you have to. I, I, I would say warn everybody to be very careful when you interpret. That's one thing. Second thing is that unfortunately when you collect. I would say, unfortunately, but I say it's just, you have to be careful. So when you collect a stream sediment sample or whatever sediment sample, you have to be aware of the hydromorphological conditions. So it's a lowland, it's a lowland uh, river. So it's a flat area river. It has a different significance represented when you have the same stream sediment in a hilly area. So it's alpine area, you know, a small stream running very fast, very erosive. Okay, of course, Turkey is mostly a hilly area, so it's easy for you, <laughs> okay? But, but anyway, uh, so then you have to be also very much aware of the hydromorphological conditions. However, based on this, the last 50 years of experience, and that's my last conclusion to answer your question. Based on the 50 years of experience of exploration, geology, geochemistry, and this uh, global and Europe, European uh, geochemical maps, which I showed to you, uh, I am absolutely certain that the stream sediment samples are indeed a good representative of the whole catchment. And because they integrate both in space and in time, uh, and it's very important. So it's also a time and space integrative uh, sediment representing uh, you know, this uh, catchment, both in space and time, uh, which is a good uh, a point for any further analysis, including medical geology or health issues. But however, like in, uh, if I guess, you know, I know, I know that you know the water for directive. Now we are uh, sampling sediment for the long-term monitoring, suppose surveillance monitoring to locate the problem areas. However, if you locate the problem area, the water for directive requires even for water, actually primarily for water to do sort of operational monitoring, which means that when you identify in an area, in a catchment uh, problem area, you're using your out, stream sediment, for example, then you should follow up, you know, in the catchment upstream, where is the potential source, like a mining area, and there you should install uh, so-called operational monitoring, then you really monitor the emission or the environment just next to the, to the uh, contamination source. And that's a, different, that's a different business, which means 
that uh, in summary, if you collect a, a stream sediment sample, it's a good serving, it's a good orientation, it's a good orientation tool, but it does not uh, answer your specific questions of the local emission and then uh, the local health problem. I don't believe that. So you have to make a more detailed follow-up uh, sampling to identify the real health issues. That's my belief now. Uh, okay, dear Jordan, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, okay, I know that you are so tired now, but I have two questions. One of I'm them. I'm so happy, actually. I'm so happy. Such as interesting. The one of the question about the pesticides. Uh, oh the, my. Carl said that how can calculate the, the pesticides under uh, mostly uncontrolled application? Can you hear me? How to how? Yeah, how I hear you, but control, uh, just how can uh, control, pesticides, but what's the... Control and calculated the element under mostly uncontrolled uh, application in agriculture activity. activity. <sighs> yes, uh, this, this is a very good question. Since I'm also a government guy, you know, uh, uh, of, and of course working in the, under the European Union legislation, which I fully support and agree with, is that the final solution of all these environmental problems is to control the emission, either at, at point sources, industrial sources primarily, or pesticides is a, is a non-point source, agricultural area, but it also has to be controlled. So the emission, the source should be controlled. So that's the ultimate solution. However, uh, I think the, the question refers to this. Right now, there is no emission control. Uh, it's not fully uh, full emission control, especially in agricultural practices. Uh, application of pesticides is special. So how much pesticides you just distribute and so on and so forth. And this is one thing. Second thing is that uh, as uh, technology is developing, there are always new and new pesticides, new and new, new and new chemicals are coming up by the industry that are used for pesticides. Now we have 600 pesticides altogether that uh, a national laboratory must be able to analyze in order to, uh, to comply with the European legislation. So that's the problem with pesticides, uh, f continuous development and new chemicals are coming out. And the second is that quite or limited control of the emission of the application of, of pesticides. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's my number one uh, answer. The second is that in terms of monitoring, uh, uh, analyzing pesticides and sampling pesticides is a very, uh, it's not a trivial task. So for example, you can see in this photo, in this uh, uh, slide, that instead of the usual plastic plastic uh, container, because of the pesticides and parks, now, uh, according to the ISO standards, by the way, we have to collect the sample in glass. This is new to me because in my whole geochemistry for sampling for heavy metals, we, I never use glass because it's, it breaks down. It's, it's very awkward in the field, but because of the organic uh, contaminants, they interact with the plastic container, may interact. You have to use a glass container you know, throughout the for the right the, the sampling so um so in a summary uh, uh sampling and monitoring pesticides is not a trivial task uh we as uh, i would say experts uh but the final solution in terms of legislation is a much better control at the emission point of pesticides so thank you okay thank you dear jordan uh, this is last question but this is my question <laughs> i want to know that which type of arsenic specification can be seen in your country? Also, I want to know that you have come across any uh, blackfoot disease in your city, your country, because we know that uh, blackfoot is, is the like a Taiwan. But yeah, <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, actually, uh, uh, if there was any blackfoot disease, that was quite in the past. Why? Because I think we were sort of lucky that uh, this arsenic issue, the ground, it's a groundwater issue. Yeah, sorry, it's not this one. Sorry, sorry. Where is this? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it's here. So the, anyway, the, 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 here. Oops. Yeah. So the black, the, the, the black food, uh, sorry, the, the arsenic uh, groundwater problem has been recognized early in the 50s. So after the Second World War, very early, it was uh, recognized, it's a problem in, uh, in the Hungarian flat areas, a certain area in Hungary. 
so that in the 60s, you know, that was a communist time, but then the government that time recognized this, and they spent a hell of uh, money on studying this and, uh, and handling this. Uh, so therefore, basically, uh, since we have modern laboratories, uh, you know, the, after the Second World War, modern laboratories, modern scientific methods, sampling and so on, and analysis, uh, black food disease uh, did not occur, you know, uh, in Hungary, to, uh, you know, to this bad uh, degree, uh, because it was very early recognized, and uh, the solution was, and still the solution is, that these areas, the settlements, these areas receive pied, you know, pied water from other areas. So they receive groundwater from long, long pipes, and uh, actually uh, the, the use of local wells is forbidden. It's regularly checked still by the government, the water authority, and you are forbidden to use it for, for irrigation or for drinking or whatever in this area. Uh, so they receive pipe water since the 60s. So uh, there are very few, but uh, I think there were other basic syndromes of uh, arsenic uh, poisonous locally coming from the past. Well, that was black food disease perhaps, you know, before the second world war. A few cases, and there were other uh, syndromes, uh, but not that, not that bad. So we were lucky; it was it, it was recognized again very early. Unlike in China or in Bangladesh, it's still a problem, unfortunately. Thank you, John. Yeah. Last short question from me. Uh, just sure. uh, uh, firstly, I would like to say uh, it has been an absolute pleasure for me, and thank you so much again for this uh, presentation. Uh, yesterday, when I was uh, searching something about uh, medical geology uh, mm -hmm. as, uh, online, uh, I saw uh, medical geology versus uh, pandemic, uh, COVID-19. <laughs> Is that possible? Uh, maybe after uh, six months? Uh, just mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious about, did you hear anything about this issue? Well, actually, thank you for the question. It's a very, very topical question. We Geochemists Internationals, of course, we talk about this. Uh, however, uh, of course, uh, you know, if, I'm not a medical expert, okay, so that's number one, okay, so there is no okay. okay. However, so that based on my experience, I would say, okay, mm -hmm. uh, of, of course, you know, there is no direct link between, uh, you know, the virus and the geochemistry. However, mm -hmm. what I do believe, as I not believe, it's, it's, it's a fact mm -hmm. that, uh, Uh, how your body, how you know, how your health, you know, how your mm -hmm. your body re reacts to the any infection, okay, any infection or actually any disease, mm -hmm. including virus, mm -hmm. ba basically your immune system yes. very much depends on what water, what food you drink, in which environment you live. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, if you saw that if you have some deficiency. You know, not that necessarily that you are such as the selenium deficiency, the cash on that you are really have distorted bones, but some deficiency. You don't have enough intake of zinc, for example, by the mm -hmm. way, also selenium or copper that would, uh, uh, you would your immune system, you know, would receive enough support, your body. Mm -hmm. Then if you get an infection, the, the mm -hmm. virus, the virus is, I, I don't think it's linked to the geochemistry, but if you receive this and your body has deficiency, you know, of uh, some chemical elements. And uh, so therefore your immune system is not strong enough, mm -hmm. then you're in trouble. Thank and you, I think this is, this is a link uh, between not necessarily the virus itself, but uh, the link how your body is protected mm -hmm. or responding to any disease, any disease. I think, however, this is a very important issue. I think a very important issue. Thank you so much, doctor. Okay, dear Dr. Jordan, uh, thank you very much uh, at hand important webinars. Uh, really, we are very happy. We are very glad. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, that very extensive talk, valuable talk. Uh, I hope that in near future, we can see you in Turkey. We can work together. I hope to. And as you know, that uh, the general director of mineral research and exploration is still working about uh, mapping of Turkey, uh, you know, that focus about medical geology. I hope that In near future, we come together, discuss it, about this issue, and then work together. Thank you very much, dear my colleagues, uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for uh, participating in this important webinar. Especially, I want to thank to Chamber of Geological Engineer of Turkey and then the General Director of Mineral Research and Exploration. Hope to see you the, uh, 
other webinar webinar in near future. Have a good time and have a good health. See you. Thank you. See you. See you. Have a good time. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.